Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Carol Tan, the head of the School of Law here at SOAS. This evening is about Kay Everett, who, if you like, stopped off at SOAS for a year after leaving the city and before embarking on a new career after her LLM here. It was to be a new career in which she was a voice for the marginalised. And that, the change of career, the type of change that she made, um, the fact that Kay learned Chinese even before she got to us, makes Kay very much a Soasian. We would recognise her a mile away as one of our students. You will see from the pamphlet that you were given on your way in that human rights, asylum, refugee and immigration, these are subjects very much at the heart of our research interests and also at the heart of our student activism um, and pro bono activities. This lecture series, coupled with the K. Everett Prize for the best human rights law dissertation by a postgraduate student, came into being with the dual purpose of remembering Kay and inspiring the next generation. Now that next generation includes the young practitioners who are here this evening. It includes our current students and it includes our future students whom we've also invited to this event. So to this next generation and to Kay's family, um, her colleagues, and her friends present here this evening, a very warm welcome from us at SOAS Law School. I would like to extend a particularly warm welcome to tonight's speaker, and that is the Right Honourable Lord Justice Rabinda Singh. Thank you very much for agreeing to give this lecture. The honour and privilege is mostly ours. <clears throat> Well, I will catch up with you at the end of this lecture. Um, and uh, meanwhile, I will hand you over to David Chirico of One Pump Court, known to many of you, of course, as a leading barrister in the field. David. Oh. So I am going to be short um, because I'm not the person that anyone's come to see. It is a great pleasure and a privilege to have been asked to take part in comparing this event um, and just to talk a little bit about the event and a little bit about Kay. Um, I used to sit many years ago in a previous life looking out at this building from my office in Senate House when I was teaching at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies um, long before I came to the bar and did any of these things. Um, and so it's a pleasure to, and, and I'm very grateful to SOAS for having invited us all here and for having invited me. Um, it's a privilege to be asked to participate in this, which is the second edition of this memorial event, which is organized by the School of Law here at SOAS and commemorates Kay. Kay, who was just such an inspiring friend and such an inspiring colleague to so many of us here looking around the room. Um, it's a privilege and it's also a pleasure to be taking part in this event. Kay would be uh, perhaps a little amused and certainly very proud to have her name associated with uh, with the with this event with the prize giving and with the lecture which follows on from it it's an event which recognizes Kay's commitment to the use of law the use of law as a tool in protecting and furthering the interests of vulnerable clients the vulnerable clients whom uh, who to whom Kay was herself so committed and this event recognises Kay's, Kay's commitment in three ways. It brings together three things, all of which absolutely reflect what we know about Kay and what Kay gave us. Firstly, there's the prize, which Lord Justice Singh will be presenting when I finally finish, and will be presenting to Cara de Lacey, who's um, oh, I've just lost sight of, but that's, oh, there we are. Um, that's because I have, I've got the wrong glasses on, so I've not put them on at all. Um, that's, that's a part of this, that's the part of the event which honours 
as Carol said, it honours real excellence in legal studies and in education, something that Kay would have so strongly supported, and it encourages training and learning about law and the connection between law and human rights. That's the first thing. The second is that this is an event which brings all of us together. It brings us together as people who work with law and human rights law. It's an event which values our, collect our, co our collectivity. It values the mutual support we give to each other as people working in the field of human rights law. And that's whether we're working as caseworkers, as lawyers, as court staff, in the judiciary. And Kay was someone who had absolute respect for all of the different parts, all of the different branches of law, um, whether, those were, whether those were parts of the law which were conducted by legal professionals or not. And these are stressful times, stressful times for all of us working in this area, and it's, it's always great to be in, involved in an event like this which brings us together. And that's the second thing that this event represents. And the third thing is the lecture itself. I'm not going to spoil the plot, in fact I don't know the plot, um, but that's the opportunity for all of us to take some time out to listen to the law. And for a lot of us here, uh, maybe everyone, we are ground down by legal aid, other administration, day-to-day uh, -day tasks, we're ground down by the fact that we're confronted by the needs of vulnerable clients, um, by difficulties in the law, by difficulties with our jobs, we're tired. And it's important to be reminded that as people working with law and human rights law, we have a tool, we are equipped with a tool, which we can use to make sure that the right balance, or to help to make sure that the right balance is struck between the interests of the state and the interests of our clients. And that's something which you see in the title of the, uh, of the lecture, which Lord Justice Singh is going to be delivering when I finish. But we have the tool uh, we're equipped with a tool which enables us to help to ensure that the right restraints are placed on the activity of the state. And that's what, when I get away from this lectern, you'll hear Lord Justice Singh talking about the Investigatory Powers Tribunal and, and the, concern, the, 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 the role of that tribunal in ensuring that the balance is, is struck between those two sets of interests. So all of those things, the encouragement of new students and of students learning about the law, our sharing and collaborate, collaboration as people working in the field of human rights law, um, the valuing of law and us taking the time to, to, to be interested in the law as a tool for the protection of vulnerable in, individuals, they all came together in the person of Kay. And I can look around the room here and see the number of people who've benefited from Kay's encouragement. We've been her colleagues, we've been her trainees. Um, we have been perhaps courts who have benefited from the immaculate preparation and the respect which Kay paid to the, to the legal system that she chose to practice in. And so it's, it, it, it is, again, a privilege to be asked to take part in this event. So now, just a, f a couple of words about tonight's speaker, and I, I really don't think that Lord Justice Singh needs much in introduction. Uh, I'm certainly reluctant to, to plunge into a sort of this is your life. Um, but just a, a, a few sort of keynote facts. Um, he came to the bar in 1989, having studied at, at Cambridge University and then studied under Professor Frank Newman in the University of California at Berkeley. Um, he went on to teach law for a period at Nottingham University. In 2000, he was one of the founder members of Matrix Chambers. He became Rabinder Singh QC in 2002. I'm sorry if I'm getting any of these dates wrong by the way, but um, so far so good. In 2003, he was, a, he was appointed as a deputy judge of the High Court, at the time was the youngest ever um, High Court judge, appointed as a full-time High Court judge in 2011, having also served as a recorder, and of course was appointed a judge of the Court of Appeal in 2017, and, and now speaks to us as Lord Justice Singh. Um, as a practitioner, he had a reputation as one of the great experts on among other things, discrimination law, uh, and in cases relating discrimination to civil rights. So he appeared for liberty in the Belmarsh cases um, in, in, in 2004, um, appeared in the case, the case of Gaydon and, and Godan Mendoza on discrimination against same-sex same partners, um, appeared in all of the litigation dealing with the exclusion of asylum seekers from uh, from 
asylum support if they didn't make asylum claims sufficiently promptly and so on in the 2004-2005. And it's that experience which, um, which of course, he, he brings to the judiciary since being appointed as a judge. Um, he sat thinking of cases that Kay was particularly interested in, um, in the High Court in cases relating to uh, the inhuman and degrading treatment of immigration detainees in the UK. Um, and looked at Equality Act duties and the formulation of policies about detention of, of, of migrants, of immigrants. Uh, he's also much more recently looked at, at, at dealt, dealt in the Court of Appeal with the treatment of, uh, of, of, of children trapped in, or tr children stuck in Calais and the duties of disclosure around that, in a case which I think mo most people here will be familiar with. And it's against that background um, that um, that, 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 that Lord Justice Singh now also sits as the, uh, or, or now comes to us to speak about the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. I think I'll stop saying anything more about that because I think that you'll probably say, say more about that at that stage. Um, what I would like to say before I close then is that there is a theme which runs through this evening. Um, Cara de Lacy's absolutely fascinating dissertation, which I've, I've been lucky enough to be able to read, looks at the ways in which, and I'm, I summarise it so badly, um, but it's an area of law I know nothing about, um, and it looks at the ways in which human rights due diligence concepts can be applied in the context of globalised trade. So Kara takes as a starting point the deaths of fabric workers in Bangladesh when the, Rana, when the Rana Plaza building collapsed and looks at the ways in which international human rights law and due diligence law can be expanded to ensure that the buyers of products um, made by fabric workers in Bangladesh will be protected by, um, will, will be protected, that res responsibility will be placed on the buyers for the safety of the workers who produce the products. And that's the kind of innovative approach to human rights law, which I know that, that Kay would have been delighted to have her name associated with. And it represents also the, our need, the fact that we need to look at the law that we are equipped to deal with and to be, to be thinking about the ways in which we can apply it outside the box. It's something that Kay was great at doing. Um, applying it outside the box and looking at ways in which we can use it to protect people who are not obviously protected by it. And in a similar way, the law on investigatory powers, the law on surveillance, is a law which is developing to deal with forms of potential intrusion into our privacy, into our homes, which the drafters of human rights provisions, the draft, dra drafters of, 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 of human rights um, <coughs> sorry, conventions would, would, would simply not have envisaged, envisaged some things that would not have been anticipated or in, in the minds of, of, of legislators 30 years ago even, certainly not 60 years ago. And the, I'm, I'm sure that what you will be hearing um, today from Lord Justice Singh will explore the ways in which uh, legal principles about privacy and, 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 and about the right to respect for the home can be developed and can be developed to, to enable the citizen to be protected adequately against the, the new intrusive powers of the state. And Kay herself would be a great supporter of this. She herself, and Carol's already talked about it, she crossed over from corporate law into human rights law. Having crossed over into immigration law, she was then part with James Elliott of the, the setting up of the, the public law team um, in Wilson Solicitors. She showed that she recognised the need to be learning new areas of law and innovating in areas of, of law. And she would be delighted at the innovative approaches that are set out in Cara's dissertation. And so at that point, I would like to invite Cara up um, to receive the certificate. Um, so this is the prize, the Kay Everett Prize for the best postgraduate dissertation. And the title of the dissertation is Corporate Due Gil Diligence. Sorry, just come forward. Corporate Due Diligence and Accountability. I'm not really good at the stage management bit of this. Um, I'd now like to invite Lord Justice Seat to come over and pre present the certificate. <laughs>
Um, so many people will want to read that dissertation. It will be available online, I'm assured, on the Wilson's website. So please do read it. It's absolutely fascinating. It's a brilliant dissertation. And as I say, it's an area of law I, I was absolutely unfamiliar with. All right, I'm going to sit down now. And with great pleasure, I'd like to in invite Lord Justice Singh to deliver his speech now. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. It's a genuine pleasure to give this year's Kay Everett Memorial Lecture. Kay Everett was a truly remarkable person. I doubt if there are many others who would have the courage to do what she did. Midway through her career with a magic circle firm of solicitors, she decided to embark on an LLM here at SOAS on the subject of human rights law. She then devoted her life and career to helping others by making use of that knowledge and experience. Her life was sadly cut short when she was only 43, but her memory lives on and inspires others. The theme of my lecture this evening will be the work of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, or IPT. I was appointed president of that tribunal in September last year. I hope you will find it interesting to hear about the history and work of this tribunal. It is a tribunal whose work is perhaps not as well known as it should be. It is also a relatively rare kind of tribunal in that its jurisdiction extends to all four constituent nations of the United Kingdom. The activities over which the IPT has jurisdiction include surveillance, interception of communications, and the use of covert human intelligence sources, or CHIS as they are known in the jargon, or informants as they are known more colloquially. The public authorities which are within its remit include the police, local authorities, and central government departments. Perhaps most significantly, its jurisdiction includes complaints made by members of the public against one of the security and intelligence agencies. The IPT has been described by one commentator, Ian Cobain, as the most secretive court in this country. On the other hand, the very fact that the IPT exists to review the legality of actions of bodies which necessarily have to operate in secret may itself be a tribute to the rule of law in this country. As one academic commentator, Paul F. Scott, has put it in his recent study, the national security constitution. Where the pursuit of national security ends reaches further into the constitutional landscape than was previously the case, that fact is often in large part the consequence of there having been formalized in law processes and actions which would previously not have taken place or would have happened without legal authority. What is presented in his book as the emergence of a national security constitution, <clears throat> he suggests, is in many ways the consequence of developments which are themselves, from the point of view of the rule of law, unambiguously positive. The IPT was created by the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000. It's frequently referred to as RIPA. It succeeded several earlier bodies, including the Interception of Communications Act Tribunal, which had been created in 1985. The IPT's first president was a Court of Appeal judge, Lord Justice Mummery, who served from its inception in 2000 until his retirement in 2013. Its second president was a High Court judge, Mr. Justice, later Sir Michael Burton, who served from 2013 until 2018. Ripper also makes provision for there to be a vice president, a post which is currently vacant, but which we hope will be filled in the near future. In addition, there are other members. 
Those other members include two serving High Court judges from England and Wales, a retired High Court judge from Northern Ireland, and senior practitioners from England and Wales and Scotland. I'll begin with some history. The history of spying long predates modern technology, such as computers or even telephones. The leading historian of intelligence matters, Christopher Andrew, suggests that the history of espionage can be traced back to Moses in the Old Testament. In his recent magisterial history of intelligence, he says that the first major figure in world literature to emphasize the importance of good intelligence was God. After Moses had led his people out of captivity in search of the promised land, he was told by God to send spies to the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. In England, by Elizabethan times, if not before, we can already see the phenomena of interception of communications and code breakers. Frances Walsingham, who was Queen Elizabeth I's principal secretary of state between, between 1573 and 1590, was particularly keen to keep a careful eye on what was being said in letters written by Mary, Queen of Scots. Indeed, it was a letter which had been intercepted and which appeared to endorse a suggestion that Queen Elizabeth should be assassinated that led to Mary's death warrant. According to Professor Andrew, it was in 1592, in Shakespeare's play Richard III, that the first use of the word intelligence is to be found in its modern sense of secret information. During the brief time when England was a republic in the Commonwealth era after the Civil War, a deciphering branch was created. It was to last from 1653 until Victorian times. The General Post Office was created in 1660 after the restoration of Charles II. It seems clear that from its inception, postal communications were liable to be intercepted by agents of the state. This practice was recognized for the first time in an act of 1711 in the reign of Queen Anne. In 1844, it was discovered after a scandal concerning the interception of the post of the Italian exile Giuseppe Mazzini that this practice was not uncommon. There was outrage in the House of Commons that something so un-English could have been happening in this country. This led to the abolition of the deciphering branch and the secret office of the post office. According to Christopher Andrew, this had the consequence that at the outbreak of the First World War, Great Britain did not have a code-breaking facility. It quickly found that it needed one. In the meantime, in 1909, there was established the Secret Service Bureau. Of course, its existence was not announced or even acknowledged for many decades. At first, it consisted of just two officers, one responsible for domestic matters and the other for foreign intelligence. The original officers, Sir Vernon Kell and Sir Mansfield Cumming, became, respectively, the first heads of the Security Service, or MI5, and the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. It's in honor of coming that to this day, the chief of MI6 is known as C, and not M, as in the James Bond stories. <laughs> the third agency, which now forms part of the UK intelligence community, is the Government Communications Headquarters, or GCHQ, whose origins lie in the Government Code and Cipher School, created after the First World War, and which famously worked at Bletchley Park during the Second World War, although this was kept secret for many decades after the war. And incidentally, if you haven't been, there is a very good museum now at Bletchley Park uh, where you can uh, see uh, how they uh, deciphered the Enigma Code in particular. What's happening for, uh, what's, what's important for present purposes 
is that the security and intelligence agencies are subject to the law of the land, including the requirements of RIPA and the Human Rights Act. By putting complaints under those acts against one of the agencies into the IPT, Parliament has sought to ensure both that such complaints can be made to an independent judicial body and that the interests of national security are protected. I'm going to turn now to the impact of the European Convention on Human Rights. In 1979, in a case called Malone and Metropolitan Police Commissioner, an action concerning interception of telephone calls pursuant to a warrant issued by the Home Secretary failed in the High Court on the simple ground that unlike interception of the post, there was no interference with rights of property. Sir Robert McGarry, the Vice-Chancellor, held that there was no right to privacy at common law. The case of Malone against United Kingdom went to the European Court of Human Rights, where it succeeded in 1984. It was that decision which led to the first statute regulating the interception of telephone communications, the Interception of Communications Act 1985. And it was the 1985 Act which established a tribunal, which was one of the three predecessors to the IPT. The law in this area was first developed by the European Court of Human Rights in the seminal case of class against Germany. The court observed that powers of secret surveillance of citizens, characterizing as they do the police state, are intolerable, sorry, are, are tolerable under the convention only insofar as strictly necessary for safeguarding democratic institutions. The court stressed that although states need to be able to respond to threats of terrorism, this does not mean that they enjoy an unlimited discretion to subject persons within their jurisdiction to secret surveillance. The court emphasized that surveillance poses the risk of undermining or even destroying democracy on the ground of defending it. And so states may not, in the name of the struggle against espionage and terrorism, adopt whatever measures they deem appropriate. It's important not to lose sight of the underlying values which are protected by the right to privacy. As a recent academic article by Kirsty Hughes on mass surveillance and the European Court of Human Rights puts it, privacy is not only an individual right. She says that it also has important societal benefits. It acts as a bulwark against totalitarianism. It provides the space in which ideas, particularly controversial ideas, can be formed, developed, explored and expressed. It fosters social relations. And by protecting privacy, we protect those that are typically subject to the most intrusive measures, including ethnic and religious minorities and those of low socioeconomic status. Thus, privacy contributes to a democratic, intellectually vibrant, harmonious, and egalitarian society. Let me say a word about the origin and history of the IPT. The IPT was established under Section 65 of RIPA. That act came into force on the 2nd of October 2000. Many in this room will remember that day. It is no coincidence that that was the same date on which the Human Rights Act came into full force. This is because RIPA was intended to ensure compliance with this country's obligations under the ECHR so far as they relate to investigatory powers. The Act, therefore, fits into the framework of human rights law, which was created at that time. Importantly, Section 65.2 provides that the IPT is the only appropriate forum in relation to proceedings against any of the intelligence services for any acts alleged to be incompatible with the Convention rights. In the case of the intelligence services, therefore, the jurisdiction of the IPT is not confined to investigatory powers as such. It covers all conduct of the intelligence agencies which is alleged to breach Section 7 of the Human Rights Act. Under Section 67, 2 and 3, 
the IPT must apply the principles applicable by a court on an application for judicial review. However, as has now become clear since 2000, the principles applicable on judicial review include an allegation that a public authority has acted unlawfully under Section 6 of the Human Rights Act. Accordingly, the IPT has the same jurisdiction to consider breaches of the Convention rights as an ordinary court would do in a claim for judicial review. However, the IPT does not have the power to make a declaration of incompatibility in respect of primary legislation. This is because it is not a court within the meaning of Section 4 of the Human Rights Act. In his report of 2015, A Question of Trust, David, now Lord Anderson QC, did make a recommendation that consideration should be given to conferring the power to make a declaration of incompatibility on the IPT. This was not accepted when Parliament enacted the Investigatory Powers Act 2016. That said, it should be noted that David Anderson felt that a possible alternative reform would would be to introduce a right of appeal from the IPT, which would then render it less important that the IPT itself may not grant a declaration of incompatibility. That recommendation was accepted by Parliament in enacting Section 242 of the 2016 Act. Under Section 67.8 of RIPA, it had been provided that there was to be no appeal from a decision of the IPT, except to such extent as the Secretary of State may by order otherwise provide. No such order was made at the time. However, an order has now been made, bringing into force the amendment made by Section 242. The new appeal route was introduced from the 31st of December 2018. Since the courts to which an appeal will lie, including the Court of Appeal of England and Wales, do have the power to make a declaration of incompatibility, it should not be a practical problem that the IPT does not have that power. The question whether the jurisdiction of the IPT in relation to the conduct of the security and intelligence agencies is an exclusive one came before the Supreme Court in a case called A and Director of Establishments of the Security Service. In that case, the claimant was a former senior member of the Security Service who had written a book about his work with the service and wished to publish it. He was bound by strict statutory and contractual obligations as well as duties of confidentiality, and he was required to obtain the consent of the Director of Establishments before he could publish. The director refused to give his consent to publish parts of the book. The claimant commenced judicial review proceedings in the High Court, alleging that this was contrary to his right to freedom of expression in Article 10 of the ECHR. The Supreme Court held that only the IPT has jurisdiction to hear claims under Section 71A of the Human Rights Act, and that Section 65 of RIPA did not limit that exclusive jurisdiction to proceedings arising out of the exercise of regulated investigatory powers in that act. The judgment of the court was given by Lord Brown. He made the particular point that the doctrine of neither confirm nor deny, or NCND, meant that it is important that cases against the secret uh, security and intelligence services should be brought not in the ordinary courts, but in a specialist tribunal that has the appropriate procedures to handle such cases. Furthermore, Lord Brown responded to the criticisms which were made of the IPT's procedures, in particular the suggestion that they were flatly contrary to the basic principles of open justice, when he said, claims against the intelligence services inevitably raise special problems and simply cannot be dealt with in the same way as other claims. This indeed has long since been recognised, both domestically and in Strasbourg. In that context, Lord Brown quoted what Lord Bingham had said in The Crown Against Shaler. 
The need to preserve secrecy of information relating to intelligence and military operations in order to counter terrorism, criminal activity, hostile activity and subversion has been recognized by the European Commission and the Court in relation to complaints made under Article 10 and other articles under the Convention. The thrust of these decisions and judgments has not been to discount or disparage the need for strict and enforceable rules, but to insist on adequate safeguards to ensure that the restriction does not exceed what is necessary to achieve the end in question. The ACID test is whether in all the circumstances the interference with the individual's convention right prescribed by national law is greater than is required to meet the legitimate object which the state seeks to achieve. Until very recently, the tribunal's procedural rules were those set out in the rules enacted at its inception in 2000. The language of Rule 9.6 of those original rules was clear and unqualified. It stated, the tribunal's proceedings, including any oral hearings, shall be conducted in private. That language was mandatory and on its face admitted of no exceptions. Nevertheless, on the 23rd of January 2003, the tribunal gave its judgment in uh, two applications, which were rulings on preliminary issues of law. As the tribunal observed, this was the first occasion on which the tribunal sat in public. As later became apparent, the case was about a Mr. Kennedy. The relevant provision in the rules was challenged by Guardian newspapers under the Human Rights Act, relying upon the right to a fair and public hearing in Article 6, as well as Articles 8 and 10. The tribunal comprised the then President, Lord Justice Mummery, and Vice President, Mr. Justice Burton, and they gave a joint judgment. At that time, Rule 9.2 provided that the tribunal shall be under no duty to hold oral hearings, but they may do so in accordance with this rule and not otherwise. The tribunal reached the conclusion that the absence from the rules of an absolute right to either an inter partes oral hearing or failing that to a separate oral hearing in every case was within the rulemaking power in RIPA. It was also compatible with the ECHR. However, when it came to the absolute requirement that hearings must be in private, the tribunal concluded that this was ultra vires, the enabling power. Accordingly, it did not bind the tribunal. The tribunal concluded that there was no conceivable ground for requiring legal arguments on pure points of procedural law to be held in private. The tribunal also concluded that unless and until the rules were amended, the tribunal would have a discretionary power uh, to hear legal argument in public. This was subject to the important qualification that the tribunal continued to be subject to its duties in both RIPA and Rule 6.1. Rule 6 required the tribunal to carry out their functions in such a way as to secure that information is not disclosed to an extent or in a manner that is contrary to the public interest or prejudicial to national security or other interests specified in Section 69. There is now a similar provision in the 2018 rules in Rule 7. In its judgment in that early case, the tribunal also referred to the inherently secret nature of much of its work. It said that in general, the work of the security services must be carried out in secret in order to safeguard national security. National security may be compromised and harmed by the disclosure of the fact of surveillance. It was for that reason that the tribunal concluded that the long-standing policy of successive governments that they neither confirm nor deny whether interception or surveillance has taken place was lawful and compatible with the Human Rights Act. This flowed from the general and fundamental considerations which the tribunal described as follows. Cases involving national security are at the cutting edge of convention rights. One of the main responsibilities of a democratically elected government and its ministers is to safeguard national security. Intelligence gathering by the use of investigatory powers is an essential part of that function. 
Otherwise, it may not be possible to forecast and foil attempts to overthrow democratic institutions and laws, including convention rights, by undemocratic means. Interception of communications and surveillance are obvious methods of gathering intelligence. Legitimate security and intelligence systems are allowed to use those methods on the basis that they must operate within the law in order to protect the very rights and freedoms guaranteed by the Convention. To counterbalance those considerations, the Tribunal observed that as the exercise of investigatory powers potentially conflicts with individual rights of person, property and privacy, there must be a proper means of safeguarding individuals from and providing redress for unjustified infringement of their rights. It is the function of the Tribunal to inquire into and determine the lawfulness of any use of investigatory powers and to provide redress where appropriate. They must do so impartially, operating as an independent body, discharging judicial functions within the legislative framework of RIPA and the rules, as properly interpreted by the Tribunal in the light of the Convention requirements of fair trial and open justice. Ever since its decision in Kennedy in 2003, the IPT has developed the practice of holding a hearing in public, if that is possible, and is compatible with the public interest. In particular, it will often hold a hearing in public to consider a question of law on the basis of assumed facts, without at that stage deciding whether those facts are true or not. Now, I often get asked the question, is the tribunal part of the tribunal system? The IPT is not part of the general tribunal system in this country, which was established by the Courts, Tribunals and Enforcement Act 2007. That act implemented the proposals which had been made by Sir Andrew Leggett in his review of tribunals in uh, 2001. Sir Andrew specifically addressed the position of the IPT and said that this tribunal is different from all others in that its concern is with security. For this reason, it must remain separate from the rest and ought not to have any relationship with other tribunals. It is wholly unsuitable, both for inclusion in the tribunal system and for administration by the tribunal service. We have accordingly come to the conclusion that this tribunal should continue to stand alone. I want to turn to a different topic now, which is the role of counsel to the tribunal. Over the last 12 years or so, the tribunal has developed the practice of instructing counsel to the tribunal. Not in every case. Uh, it's important to note that counsel to the tribunal does not represent any of the parties in a case. But nor is he or she a special advocate of the kind that is now familiar, for example, from the Special Immigration Appeals Commission. The closest analogy is probably with counsel to a public inquiry. The original tribunal rules of 2000 made no mention of counsel to the tribunal. Nevertheless, the tribunal has, at least since 2006, used its broad powers to regulate its own procedure to instruct counsel to the tribunal. The first occasion on which I'm aware this happened was a case called C against the police and Secretary of State for the Home Department, in which the tribunal had to consider whether it had jurisdiction to deal with police employment-related surveillance cases. The Attorney General was asked to appoint an advocate to the tribunal. This followed the practice and procedure which is now familiar uh, from a memorandum of 2001. And of course, the term advocate to the court has replaced what used to be called the amicus curiae. Since that time, the practice has developed whereby the tribunal simply instructs counsel to assist it without the need for appointment by the Attorney General. In a case in 2014, Liberty and Privacy International and Secretary of State and others, counsel to the tribunal, who was on that occasion Martin Chamberlain QC, made written submissions which are recorded in the tribunal's judgment in which he set out the role of counsel to the tribunal and distinguished it from the role of a special advocate. He said, a special advocate is appointed 
uh, to represent the interests of a party at hearings from which that party is excluded. A special advocate is required to be partisan. He or she makes such submissions, if any, as they consider will advance the interests of the excluded party. If the special advocate reaches the view that it would not advance the interests of the excluded party to make submissions at all, then the proper course is to decline to make submissions, even though this leaves the tribunal without assistance. Counsel to the tribunal performs a different function, akin to that of Amicus Curiae. His or her function is to assist the tribunal in whatever way the tribunal directs. Sometimes the tribunal will not specify from what perspective submissions are to be made. In these circumstances, counsel will make submissions according to his or her own analysis of the relevant legal or factual issues. At other times, in particular, where one or more interests are not represented, the tribunal may invite its counsel to make submissions from a particular perspective, normally the perspective of the party whose interests are not otherwise represented. That description of the role of counsel to the tribunal clearly formed the basis for the definition of such counsel, which is now to be found expressly in Rule 12 of the 2018 Procedure Rules. Uh, that provides that the tribunal may appoint counsel uh, where the complainant is not legally represented, the respondent objects to the disclosure of documents or information to the complainant, the tribunal intends to hold a hearing in the absence of a complainant, or in any other circumstance in which the tribunal considers it appropriate to do so. The rule now provides that the tribunal may request counsel to perform various functions which are listed. They include cross-examination of a witness called by the respondent in the absence of the complainant to ensure that all the relevant arguments on the facts and the law are put before the tribunal and generally to perform any function that would assist the tribunal. Interestingly, in the context of the new appeal procedure, to which I will refer later, counsel to the tribunal now has the role, made mandatory in the rules, to seek to identify any arguable error of law in relation to any decision or determination made by the tribunal consequent upon a hearing in whole or in part in the absence of the complainant. It provides that where counsel to the tribunal does identify an arguable error of law, counsel must notify the tribunal, and when so notified, the tribunal must, subject to its general obligation to protect the public interest, disclose that arguable error of law to the complainant. There have been suggestions that in the IPT there should be the opportunity to have a special advocate whose function would be to represent the complainant, at least in addition to counsel to the tribunal, whose function, as I have mentioned, is primarily to assist the tribunal and is not to represent the complainant in a partisan way. The recent judgment of the Strasbourg Court in the Big Brother Watch case noted it would appear with approval the role of counsel to the tribunal and how it can help to ensure that the overall procedure is fair. I'll now turn uh, to that judgment in some more detail. Uh, this is the Big Brother Watch case. The European Court of Human Rights considered the role of the IPT in secret surveillance cases in Kennedy against the United Kingdom in 2010. The court held that proceedings before the IPT had been compliant with Article 6 since any procedural restrictions were proportionate to the need to keep secret sensitive and confidential information and did not impair the very essence of the right to a fair trial. However, the court expressed some concerns about whether proceedings before the IPT should be regarded as an effective remedy so as to require the procedure to be exhausted under Article 35 of the ECHR before an application could be made to Strasbourg. In its recent judgment in Big Brother Watch, the court returned to these issues. 
It observed that the IPT's ruling in Kennedy had come very early in its history. In fact, as I have mentioned, it was the first time that the IPT had sat in public. In the 15 years which had passed since that time, the court considered that the experience of the IPT and the very real impact its judgments have had on domestic law in practice meant that the concerns expressed in Kennedy about its effectiveness as a remedy uh, for complaints about the general compliance of a secret surveillance regime were no longer valid. The court was influenced by the consideration that the IPT was the only tribunal with jurisdiction to obtain and review what has become known in the jargon as below the waterline material. The court said that an examination of the IPT's extensive case law since Kennedy demonstrates the important role it can and does play in analyzing and elucidating the general operation of secret surveillance regimes. It noted that in the liberty proceedings, the IPT played a crucial role, first in identifying those aspects of a surveillance regime which could and should be further elucidated, and then recommending the disclosure of certain below the waterline arrangements in order to achieve that goal. Furthermore, the court noted that it would appear that where the IPT has found a surveillance regime to be incompatible with the ECHR, the British government has ensured that any defects are rectified and dealt with. So the court concluded that as a general rule, the IPT has shown itself to be a remedy available in theory and practice, which is capable of offering redress to applicants complaining of both specific incidences of surveillance and the general compliance of surveillance regimes with the ECHR. As a consequence, applicants to Strasbourg will normally be expected to exhaust their domestic remedies by pursuing the opportunity to bring proceedings in the IPT first. Nevertheless, in the special circumstances of the cases before it, and given what the court had earlier said in Kennedy, the court was prepared to hold that the particular applications before it were not inadmissible under Article 35. The court went on to consider whether proceedings before the IPT comply with Article 6. It noted that neither the Commission nor the Court has found to date that Article 6 applies to proceedings relating to a decision to place a person under surveillance. It noted further that the IPT has gone further than the Strasbourg Court in this regard. In its joint ruling on preliminary issues of law in the British-Irish Rights Watch case, the IPT accepted that Article 6 does apply to a person's claims under Section 65 2A and to his complaints under Section 65 2B of RIPA, since each of them involves the determination of civil rights. <clears throat> the European Court itself found it unnecessary to reach any firm conclusion on the applicability of Article 6, <clears throat> since it concluded that the complaint was manifestly ill-founded in any event. Therefore, the complaint under Article 6 was held to be inadmissible. <clears throat> but the court reaffirmed what it had said in Kennedy, <clears throat> namely that the procedures of the IPT are compatible with Article 6, since any restrictions on the applicant's rights are both necessary and proportionate and do not impair the very essence of Article 6. In particular, the IPT had deployed its extensive powers to ensure the fairness of the proceedings. There was scrutiny of all the relevant material, open and closed. Material was only withheld from the applicants where the IPT was satisfied that there were appropriate public and national security reasons for doing so. And finally, as I have noted, the IPT had appointed counsel to the tribunal to make submissions on behalf of the applicants in closed proceedings. Big Brother Watch UK was a decision of a chamber of the European Court of Human Rights. Earlier this month, on the 4th of February, 
the court decided that the case should be referred to the Grand Chamber and we await the judgment of the Grand Chamber uh, with interest. As I have mentioned, for the first time since its creation in 2000, the IPT's procedure rules were recently revised and are now to be found in the 2018 rules. The old rule, which had required all hearings to be in private, has been abolished. Rule 10 now provides that the tribunal is under no duty to hold a hearing, but may do so, and that it may be held wholly or partly in private. Rule 13 provides that the tribunal may receive evidence in any form and may receive evidence that would not be admissible in a court of law. Rule 11 provides for representation at hearings. And as I've mentioned, Rule 12 expressly refers for the first time to counsel to the tribunal. Rule 7.1 retains the provision, and I quote, the tribunal must carry out their functions in such a way as to secure that information is not disclosed to an extent or in a manner that is contrary to the public interest or, or prejudicial to national security, the prevention or detection of serious crime, the economic well-being of the UK, or the continued discharge of the functions of any of the intelligence services. Under Section 67.7 of RIPA, the IPT has a broad power to grant such remedies as it thinks fits, and they include the quashing of a warrant and the award of compensation. An important change has been made by Rule 15 and makes detailed provision for those circumstances in which a notification of a decision by the IPT may contain reasons. This duty remains subject to the general duty in Rule 7.1. Where the IPT make a determination in favour of the complainant, they must provide the complainant and respondent with the determination, including any findings of fact. Where the tribunal make a determination which is not a determination in favour of the complainant, the tribunal must, if they consider it necessary, in the interest of justice to do so, provide the complainant and respondent with, I quote, a summary of the determination. As I have mentioned, the 2016 Act amends RIPA to create for the first time the opportunity to appeal against decisions of the IPT. The 2018 rules give effect to this in Rules 16 to 18. The appropriate appellate court will be, in England and Wales, the Court of Appeal. In Scotland, it will be the inner house of the Court of Session. At present, it will not be possible for there to be an appeal to the Court of Appeal of Northern Ireland, but such appeals may go to another appropriate appellate court. This is because there is currently no devolved administration in Northern Ireland, and its consent would be required to bring this legislation into force in respect of Northern Ireland. The grounds on which an appeal may be made, with the leave either of the IPT or the relevant appellate court, are that there is an error of law which raises an important point of principle or practice, or that there is some other compelling reason for granting leave. The introduction of the possibility of an appeal does not have retrospective effect. It only applies to decisions taken since the 31st of December last year. Accordingly, for those decisions which were made before that date, it may still be important to know whether the IPT is amenable to judicial review. That question is currently the subject of an appeal being considered by the Supreme Court, whose judgment is awaited. Both the Divisional Court and the Court of Appeal held that judicial review is not available because there is an effective ouster clause in RIPA. Uh, that was in the case brought by Privacy International. Whatever the outcome of the case in the Supreme Court, it is worth noting what was said by Lord Justice Sales in the Court of Appeal about the general features of the nature of litigation before the IPT. He said that the context in which the IPT functions is one in which there is particular sensitivity in relation to the evidential material in issue and the public interests which may be jeopardized if it is disclosed. 
The intelligence services may have valuable sources of information about terrorist organizations, organized crime, and hostile activity by foreign powers, which would be lost if those targets of investigation and monitoring became aware of them. Human sources might be, <coughs> might be killed or threatened with serious harm if even the possibility of their existence were revealed. <clears throat> he said in that judgment that the legislative regime for the IPT deliberately creates a judicial body with powers to examine in private and without disclosure any relevant confidential evidence which cannot safely be revealed. And the body is at the same time subject to an imperative overriding rule which forbids it from requiring disclosure. In this way, the regime provides a guarantee that the important aspects of the public interest uh, are safeguarded, while at the same time enabling the IPT to examine the merits of claims against the intelligence services and others on the basis of relevant evidence. I turn uh, finally to that general question of the statutory regulation of the intelligence agencies. As we have seen, the existence of the various intelligence agencies in this country was not publicly acknowledged until the 1980s. Times have changed greatly since then. In 1989, the Security Service Act placed MI5 on a statutory footing. Five years later, the Intelligence Services Act, 1994, placed both MI6 and GCHQ on a statutory footing. The 1994 Act also established a parliamentary committee, the Intelligence and Security Committee, to monitor the work of all three intelligence and security agencies. For the first time, members of both Houses of Parliament were to be involved in the scrutiny of the expenditure, administration and policy of the secret agencies. That committee is currently chaired by the former Attorney General, Dominic Grieve, QC MP. <clears throat> Sir David Omond has held various offices, including Permanent Secretary at the Home Office and the Cabinet Office, and also Director of GCHQ. Since retirement from public service, he has been a visiting professor at King's College London and has contributed to bringing the field of intelligence studies into the academic world, in particular through his book, Securing the State. In that book, he quotes one British ambassador from 1785 who wrote to the Secretary of State in London about his involvement with secret agents. I abhor this dirty work, but when one is employed to sweep chimneys, one must black one's fingers. Sir David Omond welcomes the fact that the intelligence agencies must operate within the law, in particular respecting human rights. He says, human rights are a public good, as is security. The balance to be struck by wise government is not between security and rights, <coughs> as if to argue that by suspending human rights, security could be assured. The balance has to be within the framework of rights, recognizing that the fundamental right to life with the legitimate expectation of being protected by the state from threats to oneself and one's family is an important right that in some circumstances must be given more weight than other rights, such as the right of privacy. <coughs> this is a choice that society is able to make when there is a serious terrorist threat. In those circumstances, checks and balances of good government should come into play to provide confidence that the balance is a genuine one and that red lines are not being crossed. Remaining within the framework of rights is important, not least as a constant reminder that there are rights, such as the right not to suffer torture, which cannot be derogated. The framework of supervision also includes the Office of the Investigatory Powers Commissioner, which was created by the Investigatory Powers Act 2016. The first holder of that office is Sir Adrian Fulford, a serving judge of the Court of Appeal. 
Sir Adrian leads a team of 15 judicial commissioners and a larger team of staff and has a technical advisory panel. The commissioners have various roles under the 2016 Act, including the grant of judicial warrants where the Act requires them, in addition to warrants issued by the Secretary of State for various investigatory practices. The commissioners' duties are, however, essentially administrative, and their decisions are subject to review by the IPT. It can therefore be seen that each of the three branches of the state, Parliament, the Executive, and the Judicial Branch, has a role to play in the legal regulation and supervision of the intelligence agencies. As Sir David Oman puts it, I quote, I have argued that intelligence gathering is now a recognized avowed activity of government, but there is a need to balance secret actions for the good of the city with upholding the reputation of being the city of the good. There has to be a level of public acceptance of the activity and how it is conducted. And more importantly, perhaps, public acceptance that there is regulatory mechanism that can prevent excesses and abuses and processes for a rapid, independent way of putting things right when they go wrong. It will be a matter for others to judge, but I would hope that the IPT plays its part in that process of reassuring the public and maintaining the rule of law in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Justice Singh. We are now in a minority of persons, I'm sure, who know more about the IPT than the rest of the world. But in order that we don't remain such a tiny minority, this, um, this lecture has been video recorded and will be available uh, in, in a few days. So, I hope very much that this will be the start of a long association with the SOAS Law School. <coughs> And I hope you'll allow me to present you with a token of our appreciation. It is the most recent um, issue of the SOAS Law Journal. It is a student-run law journal and uh, has been going for a number of years now, um, even though we probably didn't expect it to have longevity because it's entirely dependent on uh, who we get who is interested amongst the student body in keeping this going from year to year. And I think it's entirely appropriate that I ask the editor-in-chief to present it to you tonight. This is uh, Himasha Wirapuliga. <clears throat> 